Guarding the Deposit is the overall title of our studies for 2 Timothy. And perhaps in our study this morning, we're going to take just a little digression to suggest that there might be something more to that phrase than meets the eye. And I think a very fascinating addition to our possible understanding of what's going on when Paul writes this letter. So, uh, as has been indicated, we're going to take a section from the fourth chapter this morning for our study, the second of Timothy chapter 4, and verses 1 to 8, under this title of Preach the Word. And of course the thing is, brothers and sisters, is that this epistle is going to be written, of course, for this young man from Lystra that Paul had met so many years before, that young brother well reported of by his ecclesia, even from the earliest of times. The young man that Paul had been led to by prophetic insight and who had appointed him to the work of the truth. And there's something, I think, very encouraging about this thought because we seem to derive from the biblical record the idea that Timothy was firstly young, secondly that he was somewhat retiring, and thirdly, is that he perhaps was not physically robust. And yet this is the one who will be the vessel of God appointed to guard the sacred trust. The servant of the Lord anointed to keep the sacred deposit. All goes to show, you see, brothers and sisters, it's got nothing to do with our outward appearance or our physical strength. It's all to do with the light of the truth that burns inside of us that counts. So what do you say, brothers and sisters, when you come to the last chapter of your last letter? What do you write? Well, the second of Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 will open with these words. I charge thee. Therefore, before God. And now we come, as it were, to the climax of the whole letter, the charge. I charge thee before God. Rotherham says, I adjure thee. Weymouth says, I solemnly implore you. And so solemn was that plea, so important was that charge, that Paul says that he makes it, I charge thee, he says, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he called upon his God and his Lord to hear the task he now laid upon his own son in the faith. I charge thee, says Paul, as a father to a son, before the father and the son in heaven, the majesty on high and the heir of all things who together see all and know all and watch all, I call upon them to witness to this charge that I give thee this day. You, you understand from that language, do we not, brothers and sisters, that he could call upon no higher authority than this, could he? I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. How serious was this appeal that Paul will make? It's interesting, actually, that the first verse says... I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. And that phrase, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, I'm going to suggest to you that I, I think it was part of an early statement of faith that was already in circulation amongst the believers at this time. Just see how this phrase appears in the New Testament record. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 42, it says, He commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of living and dead, says Acts 10 verse 42. And Romans chapter 14 verses 9 and 10 says, For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living, for we must all come before the judgment seat of Christ, says Paul. And again here in the second of Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing. 
And one last one in the first of Peter chapter 4 verses 5 and 6. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the living and the dead. So do you notice two from Peter. Acts and Peter. And two from Paul. Romans and Timothy. It's like a phrase you see that was part of the early statement of faith that was already in circulation amongst the believers, you see. Behind the scenes, the teaching of the truth was being codified and written down. Which reminds us, brothers and sisters, that when people talk about a statement of faith as being but a man-made document, that they miss the whole point of what it is to write down the things that we believe, so that we might have confidence amongst us as to what they are. Even the apostles did these things, you see. And it reminded Timothy that every generation is responsible for preserving Yahweh's heritage, those unchanging, immutable principles of divine truth. And every generation will be held accountable for their guardianship, which is a very sobering thought. You know, when, we get, when we're baptised, maybe particularly when we're baptised as young people, as most of us are, well, it's a very personal thing, isn't it, to decide to be baptised, to hearken to the call of God and to submit to his, to his requirements. But despite the personal nature of our baptism, the moment we are baptised, we join a whole community of faithful ones. And now we have responsibilities, not just for ourselves, but for what we might do or might not do for the guardianship of that whole community. It's the mystical body of Christ that we have been asked to join. And we're not just responsible for ourselves in the truth. We're responsible for the community that we have joined. In fact, let me show you something interesting. Have you just got those thoughts from those apostolic passages clear in your mind those little colored words here's an extract from our own statement of faith the Birmingham amended statement of faith it's one of the clauses in our statement of faith but notice the key words the appearing of Christ the kingdom the dead and the living who will be judged. You see, all those words come from those apostolic writings, don't they? All of those expressions. So you see, our own statement of faith captures not only this doctrine, the doctrine of coming judgment, but the very words used to describe it in apostolic times. You see, that's how we guard the heritage of the truth. The language of our statement of faith is entirely based upon the scriptural expressions of those who first enunciated these doctrines. And you would say that's man-made? I think not. And if the apostles wrote these things down, that Timothy might guard the charge, then there's every reason why we have matters written down that the heritage of the truth might be guarded in our own day as well. So now here's the charge, brothers and sisters. Chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the word. Well, that word preach is one of two words for preach in the New Testament, and this one is caruso, which means to herald, to proclaim, to set forth. It's used in conjunction with the word for gospel, evangelion, many times. Caruso evangelion, to preach the gospel. Uh, but you notice that actually Paul doesn't say here, preach the gospel. No, he says, preach the word. In fact, this is the only place where the phrase caruso logos is used. Preach the word is actually what Paul asked Timothy to do. Now that term is not so much about gospel proclamation, although that could be included. But to preach the word 
was to let the word to speak, to proclaim what the scriptures teach, to reason based upon Bible thinking. And the words that follow clarify that because when it says in verse 2, preach the word, reprove, rebuke, exhort, it's not strangers that Timothy was to reprove and to rebuke and to exhort, it was the brethren. His preaching of the word was primarily to be within the ecclesia rather than without. This charge to the, to, to the young man is about the triumph of the word being upheld in the household of faith. And that's the focus of this charge. It's not to say that Timothy might not preach the gospel, but he was to be a minister of the word amongst the community in the same way that the apostles were. Um, let me just find a cross-reference. We shan't turn it up, but Acts 6 verse 4 says that the apostles said, Look you out seven men, for we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word, said the apostles in Acts 6 verse 4. That's what Timothy's asked to do. You take up the ministry of the word in the matters of the truth. And if you think about it, you'll, you'll see that this is, in fact, a, a New Testament idea. Philippians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16 says, Among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. And that holding forth is not just about preaching outside, it's about holding forth the word inside the ecclesia of God, those shining lights. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. And it's the one another that might be taught by the holding forth of that word inside the ecclesia. Second of Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 1 says, finally brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course, or as the margin says, may run and be glorified even as it is with you. Oh, says Paul in the second of Thessalonians, that the word of God might run amongst us and govern the ecclesia in all of its activities and in all of its thinking. And the second of Timothy here, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says, Preach that word, therefore, with all long-suffering and doctrine. You see, every generation of the truth has faced challenges. Challenges to faith and to conduct. The challenges never cease. But the battleground alters as the world changes. But you know, in the end, it's the thinking of the flesh versus the thinking of the spirit. In whatever form it reveals itself, it's but the thinking of the flesh versus the thinking of the spirit. And I think what the apostle is saying to Timothy in this charge, brothers and sisters, is that the only place, the only place where the answers will be found is in the scriptures. Whatever the latest humanistic thinking is that attacks the ecclesia, and it's with us right now, is it not? The answer lies in the word, says Paul to Timothy. You set that forth. And he says, verse 2, be instant in season, out of season. The word means to be urgent, to be earnest, to be zealous, to be ready, to be prepared. The setting forth of the word was an objective that Timothy must be ready to fulfill at any time. You know, we often have ecclesial problems, don't we, brothers and sisters, that call forth for a particular problem a careful examination of scripture and what it might teach and how we might behave. But what the apostle is saying is that we've got to be committed to the guidance of scripture at all times and not just when it might suit. It's got to be taught whether it's convenient or not convenient. It's got to be upheld whether it's easy or not easy. It's got to lead us whether it's in a matter large or small. We've got to get our Bibles out and find the Bible answer to the problem. And he says, do it in these three ways. Verse 2, reprove, rebuke, Exhort. Now, the first of those words means to convict. 
The second means to discipline. And the third means to comfort. So Timothy had the scriptures at his disposal, the word that he ought to preach, but he was going to need to develop the wisdom to learn which of those aspects should be used and when and how. And I wonder, brothers and sisters, whether there might be a relationship in these three words to the three metaphors that Paul has already used. Because to preach the word so as to convict reminds us of the soldier. And to preach the word so as to discipline reminds us of the athlete. And to preach the word so as to comfort reminds us of the farmer. Preach the word, says Paul, but decide in what way the word ought to be set forth according to the problem that confronts you. And whatever you do, he says, do it with all long-suffering and doctrine in that spirit of patience that would allow the word to triumph in the hearts and minds of brothers and sisters you see. And why all this? Why this urgent charge? Because, he says, verse 3, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Now, you notice Paul doesn't reveal when the time will be. He says that simply the time will come. But there were other New Testament passages, were there not, that clearly revealed that there was a, a matter of general apostasy that was going to come upon the ecclesial world. We shan't turn these up, but let me just read them for you. Acts 20, verses 29 and 30. I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. The first of Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And in the second of Peter and chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2, it says, But there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And you see, I think what Paul is saying in this passage in the second of Timothy, in chapter 4, verse 3, is that this time is coming and you don't have much time, Timothy, to build the ecclesial world on the foundation of scriptural reasoning that will be so important. There's not much time, he says. You must take up the charge and get on with it now, because these problems are rapidly coming upon the ecclesial world, is the warning of the apostle. And you know, that idea, 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, is really a key idea in the pastoral letters, and certainly in these two epistles that Paul will write to the young men. Uh, here it is in the first of Timothy chapter 1. Verses 9 and 10, and there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. And that word sound, which is the key word here, the word uh, in the Greek, hugaino, you might sort of catch the English echo there, is from whence we derive our word hygiene. So sound here is a word that means healthy and wholesome. And where was that sound doctrine to be found? In the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Anything outside of that is not acceptable, says Paul. First of Timothy chapter 1. But here, is it, here it is at the end of the first of Timothy. First of Timothy chapter 6 verse 3 says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to sound words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, then they are proud and do not know anything, says the apostle. 
And when the second epistle opens, in the second of Timothy chapter 1 verse 13, he will say again, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, who I know. And now again in chapter 4, preach the word, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. So they're like bookends really, aren't they? At the opening and the close of both the second, the first and second letters, this exhortation to sound doctrine will be given by the apostle. The spiritual health of an ecclesia, brothers and sisters, is related to the question of whether they believe in the triumph of the word in their midst. It's the word that sets forth sound doctrine and only the word. All else is humanism. In the absence of scriptural testimony, all else is humanism. And the apostle says, it's coming upon you now, Timothy, because he says, verse 3, they will, after their own lusts, heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Do you know, even in the brotherhood today, the idea has been advanced that the experience of spirituality is of greater importance than the fundamentals of doctrine. that the mystical transcends the scriptural. And the moment we consent to that notion, brothers and sisters, that the mystical outranks the scriptural, then we have nothing left. We don't have a truth to believe in because now it's purely a matter of personal feeling, which after all is what humanism promotes. I feel, therefore it must be right. That's in the brotherhood today. And so there are challenges to ecclesial practice and challenges to personal behavior, but whatever the challenges of this generation might be, it will simply be the next, the next phase of humanistic thinking. Get back to the word, says Paul. And by the way, notice that it's not the teachers who've got itching ears. There's a comma there. They shall heap to themselves teachers, comma, having itching ears, but the itching ears belong to the hearers, not the teachers. So the Revised Standard Version says, having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own likings. It sort of reminds you of that time, does it not, brothers and sisters, on Mars Hill, when it says of the Athenians, the record says, for the, all the Athenians spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And that danger can afflict the brotherhood, brothers and sisters, that we have those who are stimulated by the new, by the different, by the novel. Let's think a different way. Let's put this a different way. Now, it's not to say that new things can't be discovered and that different things can't be appreciated. But sometimes there can be a love of different things so that that which once was commonly believed is set aside as of no value. Guard against that says Paul. In fact, he says, verse 4, they shall turn away their ears from the truth unto fables. Ah, so the phrase does relate to believers. It's all about believers, isn't it? They turn from the truth unto fables. Since the Garden of Eden, brothers and sisters, man has always expressed a dissatisfaction with the divine arrangements. Since the beginning of time, man always wants to do it just a little bit different to what God has asked. It's ever been so, brothers and sisters. It's part of our nature. And so how vital that Timothy be able to set forth sound doctrine as he preached the word. And, well, here's our little digression for today. I, I, I'm tempted, brothers and sisters, sorely tempted, because... I think there's perhaps a, a, another aspect of the second of Timothy as to how that sound doctrine might be set forth by Timothy and how he might guard the deposit in order to do so. Now, it's related to the charge that we've already looked at. Come back just quickly to the, um, where was that passage in Deuteronomy where Moses passes on the charge? It was in Deuteronomy chapter 31. You might remember this. He passes on the charge to Joshua but I just draw your attention to one other verse in that passage. Deuteronomy chapter 31, 
says this, verse 23. It says, He gave Joshua the son of Nun a charge, and said, Be strong and of good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. And it came to pass, when Moses had made an end of all these things, he wrote the words of this law in a book. Now that book was given to the Levites, but do you think Joshua had access to that book for counsel and advice? Absolutely. And when we come to the book of Joshua, you'll find certain clues in the book of Joshua that Joshua is following what was told in the book. Joshua is observing the counsel of the book, and that part of the charge that was given to Joshua that the truth might be preserved was that he was given a document. There was a documentary charge that he received so that the truth might be guarded according to the law of Moses. Now, do you remember the charge from David to Solomon? It was in the first of Chronicles chapter 28. Come and have a look at it again, because here's another little connection, you see. In the first of Chronicles chapter 28, when that charge was passed from father to son, uh, just notice first of Chronicles 28 verse 11. Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch, and of the houses thereof, and of the treasuries thereof, and of the upper chambers thereof, and of the inner parlours thereof, and of the place of the mercy seat, and the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit, of the courts, and of the chambers, of the treasuries, of the treasuries, of the courses, of the priests, and the work of the service. He had the pattern of it all, brothers and sisters. And then it says this, verse 19, All this said David, Yahweh made me understand in writing by his hand upon me, even all the works of this pattern. And David said to Solomon his son, be strong. And I think that part of the charge that David gave to Solomon was a book, the documentary evidence of what should be done. And how the truth of the worship of God in that temple to be built might be properly guarded. And Solomon received that book as part of the sacred charge that he received from David. And you see, Paul realized, brothers and sisters, that when he passed off the scene, when all the apostles were dead, that there was a danger. And come back to the second of Timothy and let's just notice another phrase from the first chapter. The second of Timothy chapter 1, you see, had put it this way and what we're suggesting is that there might be something hidden here beyond what meets the eye. Second of Timothy chapter 1 says, verse 14, that good thing which was committed unto thee Now that word committed, brothers and sisters, means a deposit, a trust consigned to one's faithful keeping. That's the very meaning of the word. Some deposit entrusted to this person for their faithful keeping. And I suggest the possibility that part of the charge that was going to be passed on from Paul to Timothy was documentary evidence to guard the heritage of apostolic faith and practice. And I'll show you why. If you come back to the second of Thessalonians in chapter 2, just a few pages back, you see this was a real possibility, wasn't there? Second of Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 2 says, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither in spirit, neither by word, nor by letter, as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. The Thessalonians had been misled about the coming of the day of Christ. But do you know what had misled them? Verse 2 says, they'd been misled by a letter that they received that purported to come from Paul. But it wasn't from Paul. It was a forgery. It was a fraudulent letter. And partly, I believe, because of that possibility of 
fraudulent documents, you'll notice that the very next chapter of the second of Thessalonians, chapter 3 and verse 17 says, the salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. And I think the suggestion is that whoever might have actually scribed an epistle on behalf of Paul, that Paul personally signed it off by hand to authenticate that this was a genuine letter from the apostle himself. Do you know that by the time Paul writes the second of Timothy, the gospel of Luke is already in circulation. The words of our Lord Jesus Christ are already in the form of a gospel. And I suggest, brothers and sisters, that part of the sacred charge that Timothy was being asked to guide, to, to guard, were a set of documents that safeguarded apostolic teaching and practice. I think, incidentally, that there were already a set of hymns circulating in the New Testament. We've got several of those hidden in the, in the New Testament record. So there could have been hymns, there could have been a statement of faith, there were certainly matters of ecclesial practice and conduct, but even copies of some of the epistles to the ecclesias, and perhaps one of the gospels, was all to be authenticated by the apostles and given to Timothy as a sacred charge that the truth might be guarded. And if that were true, it was no different to what Joshua received from Moses and Solomon received from David. Timothy would need those. So that if at any other stage, when the apostles had died, a gospel mysteriously circulated saying that we ought to go back to the law of Moses and that this is what Christ taught, there would be a basis of reference to what was authentic and true. And so 2 Timothy chapter 4, just coming back to the passage, the record says in verse 5, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. He needed a cool head and a clear mind. And keeping a clear head in the controversies of ecclesial life, brothers and sisters, is only possible when we maintain a firm scriptural perspective on the problem and its possible answer. Only the word will keep us in the right space to deal with problems that arise. And when it says, incidentally, do the work of an evangelist, there's only one passage that tells us anything about what the evangelists did. We shan't turn it up, but it's in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. And we'll find that the evangelist is placed between the apostles and the prophets, whose primary role was to witness to Christ and speak forth the word, and after them, the pastors and teachers, whose primary roles were to provide pastoral care and systematic instruction. So the suggestion is that the evangelists stood between those two. They stood between the spiritual exposition of the apostles and the practical tuition of the teachers. And Timothy would do both of those things. He would preach the word, as did the apostles, but he would be able to counsel and instruct in the matters of practical daily and ecclesial life. It's all part of the scope of Paul's charge. And how might Timothy do this? How ought he to do it? Verse 5, make full proof of thy ministry. Rodaham says, thy ministry completely fulfill. Timothy, do the very best you can. Seek for excellence in the spirit of dedication. Well, that challenge applies to us all, brothers and sisters, does it not? Seeking to fulfill our ministry in the truth and to do it as best as we can. So here's a couple of questions again for our study this morning in terms of making full proof. Now, in terms of the documentary evidence of our community, might I suggest to you, and I'm sure that you will agree, is that actually, as a community, we have one of the finest bodies of literature about the Bible within our own Christadelphian community. One of the finest. And we have the deep thoughts of many brethren who've gone before us, who've pondered probably the very same things that we ponder and have already written something about it. And many's the time when searching for answers on a matter, you'll find that Brother Roberts has already said something about it, or Brother Thomas, or Brother Walker, or Brother Carter, or Brother Tennant, or Brother Collier, or you, there's many of them, brothers and sisters, there's a whole cascade of wonderful Christadelphian writings. 
We ought to know them. I think part of how we guard the heritage of the truth as individuals is to make a commitment that at least every year we will pick another writing of our own community and read it. So that, that's a good idea for us to take away from the Bible school. What new book in the, in the writings of the truth have you never read before that you might start to read when you get home as a reading program, 30 minutes a day, somewhere in your day, to pick up a work of the truth that you've never read and enrich yourself. But you see, we don't just enrich ourselves in the ideas of the book. We enrich the heritage of the community that we belong to and we become more aware and conscious of that heritage that we already have. And like Timothy, we ought to ask ourselves as we go forth from a Bible school, what particular service in the truth might we be committed to fulfill in this coming year and what's our plan to advance it? Make full proof of thy ministry, says Paul to Timothy. The question is, what's ours? What's the thing that we might commit to especially in this coming year? Not that we haven't committed in past years, but what are we going to do in the year to come? How shall we make full proof? Well, there's lots of things that we can do, and I think one of the things that we all need to focus on, brothers and sisters, is the ecclesias that we're part of. We need to have personal contact with the Bible every day of our lives as individuals. We need to have families that are centered around the routine of the daily readings, because remember... Remember, children grow up in a household where if the daily readings are normal, they will treat the daily readings as normal. And if they grow up in a household where the daily readings are not normal, then they'll treat not doing the daily readings as normal. Make sure that our families are clustered around the daily readings and children from the earliest stage start to absorb the language and the thinking of the Bible and the scriptures and learning. We want Sunday school that might I suggest, goes back to the old-fashioned way of memorizing Bible passages that are recorded for life. Do you remember the old Christadelphian instructor lessons that every child complained they had to learn? Guess what? They stay with you for a lifetime. Because in the first critical few years of a child's life, how they imprint information is different to the rest of their life, and it stays there for a lifetime. Many of us will know of Bible quotations we learned as children in Sunday school that are already there in old age. We recollect them because they've been there, planted in our memories, learning all the stories of the Bible so they become real and vivid and Bible passages that are stored in our memory bank for use and for comfort and for guidance. We want youth classes that explore Bible first principles and scriptural answers to young people's issues. We want gospel proclamation where the things of the truth are explained with simplicity and power to interested friends. We ought never to abandon our lectures, brothers and sisters, because we forget that whether visitors from outside come or no, that all of our children are but interested friends until they're baptised. And many a child has grown up in an ecclesia where the public lectures grounded them in the doctrines of the truth. We want Bible classes that unfold the depths of Scripture and provide the meat of the Word to deepen faith and mature understanding. We want a ranging brethren who, when faced with an ecclesial problem, not only have the disposition to open their Bibles, but the ability to reach a scripturally reasoned solution to the problem together. That's what we want in our ecclesias. Let's go back and do it, brothers and sisters, so that the, the word might triumph in our community because only in the word are there the real answers. And why was all this so urgent? This charge. Verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. The personal pronouns are very poignant in their emphasis. In verse 5, the Greek words sude start the verse, but thou. And in verse 6, the Greek words ego ga start the words for I. But thou, thou must do this, for I, I must depart. 
And that's the thing, you see. The reason why Timothy had to take up this charge with all his might was because of this. There's a moment when every generation must realize that they've got to take up the mantle of responsibility to guard the truth, to keep the faith, to guide the brotherhood. And for Timothy, that time had come right now. And the reason was because Paul's time had also come now. The time of his departure. The time of his removal. And Paul knew that this time there would be no escape. He'd had to come to face the prospect of death and to be reconciled with it. You know, brothers and sisters, every saint of God reaches that moment in their lives. In Paul's case, of course, death was not to come because of age or illness or war or pestilence or famine. He was going to die because of judicial execution. He was about to die because he was a follower of Christ. He knew that it was near. And yet the marvelous thing is that he saw it not so much as an end, as a consummation. He accepted the finality of his position, but he'd already passed in mind beyond his death to the joy of the future. It was a marvelous example to Timothy of seeing beyond as he already tried to exhort him. Because, well, listen to how Rotterdam's translates verse 6 that we might that we might capture the spirit of Paul himself. So Rotterdam says, For I already am being poured out as a drink offering and the season of my release is at hand. The season of my release. He saw it as a joy. It was a marvelous spirit of resignation to the Father's will. And so he says, verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. soldier, athlete, farmer. The tones of striving, of effort, of discipline. And all the words there are in the perfect tense. So the word have is correct. I have done this. I have finished this. I have guarded this. It was all accomplished, brothers and sisters. He could do no more. It was time to pass the charge. And it was time for Timothy to take the charge upon himself. And so he says, so the apostle says in verse 8, Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me. You know, it's a, a, an interesting verse, really, because Paul wasn't usually so confident about the future. And yet here he sounds so secure, so certain, so confident. He wasn't boasting, was he, brothers and sisters? When he said, the Lord, the righteous judge, will give it me, he's not... Not certain in that sense of confidence in his own abilities. But I just wonder, given the trials that he was enduring and the prison in which he was, whether an angel of God had been sent to strengthen him. Like a certain angel had been sent into a certain garden to strengthen another person facing death in time of need. And that the angel whispered something into the apostle's ears to lift his spirits, to make him see ahead. And he certainly needed strengthening for what lay ahead because, you see what he says, which the Lord, the righteous judge. And I suggest that that phrase, the righteous judge, is perhaps a reflection upon the fact that ever so soon, the apostle would come before the unrighteous judge, Emperor Nero, to give his last defense. And in the knowledge that that unrighteous judge would not acquit him, but pronounce him guilty of death. But Paul, you see in his mind, has already beyond Emperor Nero and that fateful meeting so soon to come. He's focused on the righteous judge beyond. And to the righteous judgment that he will receive in that day, he is already looking ahead to the final consolation. 
And, and he says, not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Now, do you notice something interesting, brothers and sisters, that this little section in chapter 4 that finishes in verse 8, it begins and ends with the same thought. So you see verse 1, it says, The Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge at his appearing, and now verse 8 says, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at his appearing. And so they're like little bookends, you see, that verse 8 will finish as verse 1 has begun. And just as verse 1 tells us that the judgment will come upon both the living and the dead, Perhaps the living and the dead are hidden in verse 8, are they not, brothers and sisters? Because what Paul is really saying is, I'm the dead one. You see, I'm the dead one. My life is about to be forfeit. My life is about to, to end. But you, Timothy, are the living one. And you must carry on. But both will be held to account, whether living or dead. We're all accountable with respect to how we guard the truth. And the appearing of Christ will bring the day of judgment concerning not just our own life, but what we've done for the truth as a whole. We need always to remember, brothers and sisters, that the Christ who is our Saviour is also the Lord who will be our judge. And that the one that we follow was in his own life such an exhibition of the triumph of the word that he could be described as the word made flesh. He's the one who always sought to say, it is written, have you not read? What saith the scripture? We need to emulate our Lord Jesus Christ in this regard. So let's make pledge, brothers and sisters, that the charge to hold the word aloft in all our dealings belongs to us as much as it ever did to Timothy. And that we will accept the responsibility for guarding those things for which others have died. In the words of a hymn, which puts it this way, Be careful for nothing. The Lord is at hand. Remember the glory. Remember the land. Be fervent in spirit. Be instant in prayer. Work out your salvation with trembling and fear. Be pure in the doctrine. Be strong in the word. Preserve in its brightness the two-edged sword. The things of the kingdom, the things of the name, confessed in great Yahweh, absolve us from shame.